I am going to go ahead and call the, um, sure I will, April 9th, 2024 regular governing board meeting to order. We do not have a quorum at this time. Hopefully we will get another uh, delegate in before we need to take any action. Um, I'm calling for, for additions or changes to the agenda. There are a couple of, uh, there's one addition that I want to make. It's about the May meeting. I just want to talk about the officer's election for the May meeting. And the other thing I want to do is I want to move the finance update, which I see I left off <laughs> of the agenda. But you have treasurer's report at 6.15. Yes, I have treasurer's report. So we're going to do that immediately next. Um, so that Bonnie doesn't have to stay through all the other stuff. So does anybody have any objections to these changes to the agenda? Okay, I'm not seeing any objections. So the first thing I'm gonna say is just uh, next month is our uh, required um, election of officers. That's the treasurer, the clerk, the vice chair and the chair positions. Um, so we need to think about if you're willing to stand for any of those positions or if you're willing to continue wherever we are, um, but we won't do anything with that until May. I just wanted to remind people that it is next month at the regular board meeting. Um, and so the next thing will be the treasurer's report. And why don't you go ahead with that, uh, Janiel and David and Bonnie. Okay. Um, so I just kind of want to give you an overview of where we are uh, and what we're doing and what we're doing to plan plan ahead. Um, currently, as of today, uh, we have about $3.8 million in cash. We have about $6.6 million of prepaid uh, costs, which basically is our inventory and our prepaid make ready. We have nine, approximately nine two million in already uh, construction in progress and uh, sites. So that gives us an asset base of about 19.7 million. Um, we are paying our bills uh, on a weekly basis. So our liabilities are basically zero, which is a great place to be. Um, Year to date, we're looking at about approximately $58,000 in customer broadband revenue. Uh, and the other exciting piece is since we've moved our cash accounts around, we have about $44,000 in investment earnings. Um, so those are all, all really positive. Um, out of the 863,000 that we've, we've received from the towns, we have spent currently about 201,000 of that allocated uh, to the towns that we're working in. So um, we're in a we're in a good place, and we have taken the steps to project our cash flow through the end of 24 to see what our sustainability is going to be. And in looking at uh, completing RS01, 02, and CL03, we still are projected to be in a positive cash flow at the end of 24. And should we put a hold or stay on construction while we're waiting for bead, um, we have enough funds to carry the operations administration of CB fiber. So I feel with everything going on and the possibilities that are around the corner uh, in 25 that we're in a good good spot cash flow wise and on track. You're on mute, Siobhan. Still on mute. Siobhan, you've been on mute all this time. <laughs> That's funny. I'm sitting there telling David to go ahead and he's on mute. I <laughs> go ahead, David. So I was curious, did we get the eight hundred and sixty three thousand dollars from VCBB this week? We did get the um we got a we got an agreement. Uh, that was signed, right, Siobhan? You signed an agreement yep, on Friday night. I signed it. it got, I got notice that it was finished. I think today it was document was completed today. I think. 
And and what is that document? Yeah. What where where did the eight hundred sixty three thousand is that associated with that document? Yes, that's the the amendment document for the the grant amendment that releases those funds. So, the matching this funds. This is a town yes. match. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the town match. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. And since I'm still I'm talking. Um, the 431,000, or maybe that's not the exact number. You know what I mean, Janiel. Where do, where do we stand on that money that the VCBB said they were holding in reserve for us? Yep, um, Bonnie drafted for us an, um, a, a request, an, an invoice, and um, we'll be sending that to to uh, to Rob Fish. Um, we're going to keep it simple. We're just going to ask for the disbursement with an outline of the funds that have been dispersed and received and follow the the, the method that we've done in the past. Do, do we know if they're amenable to that or are they thinking differently? We don't know. They had uh, Alexi is new, right? So, so all of these conversations that happened were before Alexi came on, and so he had originally asked for some sort of backup. But we think that following the pr procedure that we followed in the past, with a simple accounting and a request, will suffice here because that is what sufficed in the past. So we intend to follow the past procedure and not only send it to Alexi, but make it to Rob because he has a history here and then copy um, Christine and Alexi on that request. And I think Lucy Rogers, who's the person I negotiated with to do all this stuff, she's around somewhere, right? She's employed by the state, but she's not involved in uh, VCBB. I uh, understood. Uh, if she has the institutional memory should we need somebody to remember what transpired because I yeah. gave you the emails and everything we had, but um, some of that was conversational too. Yeah, that's a good point. We could call on Lucy Rogers if necessary. She does still have the same state email address, so we know how to find her if necessary. And, and too, Derry, I did use almost the exact wording that you submitted in the proposal for the amendment to substantiate that 413,000. So we do have that amendment that I believe did go to Rob Fish as well. That that's exactly right, Bonnie. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, this uh yeah, you know, hopefully this this moves through without a problem because they they really did commit to it. Right. And I'll stop talking now. <laughs> Does anybody else have any comments or questions? No, I'm not seeing any. Okay, Bonnie, um, you can go ahead and leave. You don't need to hang out for, unless you want to. I mean, <laughs> no. you're welcome to stay. Have, have a good night, everybody. Thank Thanks, you. Bonnie. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, so that was the treasurer's report that we moved up. So next is public comment. We still do not have a quorum. I'm not seeing any public comment. We are still one shy of a quorum. Um, we're going to skip prior meeting minutes. We don't have a Jeremy Matt, which if we had a Jeremy Matt, we'd have a quorum. Just saying. Um, so then I guess construction materials, warehousing update and outlook. We Let's are in that. the process. We're in the process of, um, we do have two active crews. Uh, to, we're fin we're finishing up in CLO three. We have gone live in in four DAs in CLO one, CLO two, RSO one, and RSO two, and we're finishing up in CLO three. So construction is continuing with two crews. Um, we are in the process of transitioning our warehousing and inventory management to any K broadband. We gave Straight Line Broadband a 90-day notice. That 90-day notice expires on May 20th. So we are speaking with Straight Line bro or with NEK Broadband tomorrow to discuss the transition. Um, they've already started looking at the materials and how to palletize some things. And we're talking about how to transition uh, the 
in per, the in-person management of the warehouse as well as the finale updating so that we have a clean audit um, going into the future. So um, making sure that finale is optimized as well as the the um, management of the materials. Lucas, do you want to add anything to that update? Uh, the only thing I'll add is I talked to Patrick this morning um, from NRTC about getting splicing done on Gould Hill, which was one of the last, I believe, CLO2 um, pockets that we were waiting on. Construction's done, so we're now pushing to get the, the splicing and testing done because we had a lot of interest right there. Um, I think we had 9, 10, 11 orders already. David Healy, go ahead. Your hand's up. Did Patrick say when it was going to get done? He put the request in, but no, we did not have a date yet. So okay. hopefully he does maybe by now, but I haven't heard differently. Okay. Thanks. Is there anything more on construction update? David, your hand's still up. Um, with t the arrival of Ted, we now have quorum, so we can act if we need to. Yay, Ted, thank you. <laughs> And um, the next thing is operations update. Let's go with operations update. We have really good news here. I, I, I the, the number that we achieved. So I, I actually would love for Lucas to deliver this news. Yeah, so as of uh, late this morning, we found out we have hit 200 paying customers. So oh, that went fast. That went fast. With the arrival of more drop crews, we're able to, to really move along a lot faster now. Um, so that momentum should be keeping up right on through the rest of the backlog and hopefully within CLO 3 as well, you know, as, as we get to open that up, um, we can keep moving that and get everybody online. So that's exciting. Yay. Yeah, we're, we're, we're doing incredibly well. Thanks to, um, Waitsfield. They've really, they, they've really, they've really delivered and also a progress we've made in our procedure for, for drops. We got some feedback. Um, thanks Jeremy Hansen for, for your feedback. We have implemented a procedure where we will let the customer know when we're preparing for um, a, a drop in preparation for a later install. So um, um, for those of you who aren't aware, it, the, the installation of CV fiber comes in two steps. You have to prepare it through a drop process and then and then Waitsfield comes back later for the installation itself. And the, the procedure was that folks would just go and do the drop. They would get ahead of the drops. And we got some feedback that, um, that and uh, it is expected in the industry that we would that we would just go out and do the ready work. But then, um, but then, because we're a very rural area, there's a higher expectation of privacy. So Waitsfields has decided to um, implement our request, which is to let the the customer know when we're doing when we're doing the drop, and that's the right thing to do. John Russell, your hands up. Go ahead. John Russell, you're muted. Do you know when was that decision made? Last week, we brought it to their attention, and they immediately that same day said, "Hey, we'll we'll let the crews know that we're going to do this." They said that they had had a that there was sort of a they had expected that they would do this previously as part of the process, but I know in the industry it wasn't, it isn't standard, and also it wasn't being done routinely by our crews. Um, so this this is brand new. Okay, because there was a, an install last week in which the people just showed up here on Holtz Road and started pulling uh, fiber down to somebody's house, thinking they weren't even home. Um, they were home and they were able to uh, pull it through the conduit, but they would have left just leaving the fiber all coiled up next to the pole, except that uh, I happened to drive by and said, say, what's going on? Um, so I hope that they will actually start doing it because nobody was set up for them to be there. Okay. 
That's good to know. Yeah, we, we did discuss it again today on our operations call. We are understanding that they're being reminded, the crews are being reminded that this is important to us to notify the customer. Well, and again, well, we don't notify, but we knock on the door. So drops do not get planned ahead. It's, it's, it's just knock on the door. Hey, this is what we're doing. Okay, well, apropos of that, they did knock on the door, but they knocked on a door which can't be heard from inside the house because it's in a on a porch, and um, they were just going to leave this stuff next to the pole. Um, and like I said, though, I I did stop by, but nobody was ready. Nobody was ready for them. A great crew. No, no problem with the crew. They're wonderful people. Josh and I, I didn't get the other person's name, but they were great. They did the job beautifully, et cetera, et cetera. But like I said, nobody was ready. So just walking up to somebody's house, they, they may not be home. Um, well, so that's why they do so, it that way, though, because there's nothing to be ready for. All they have to do is be outside. There's no inside work at that time. There was inside work. They pulled it through the conduit into the cellar. Well, so, oh, okay, well, that's a different scenario than than usual then. Okay. It, Usually it, the conduit's on the outside of the house where they place the ONT. So that's a little bit different, yeah. But everybody should, have, should have, everybody should have known that this was inside because somebody had visited and seen that the uh, pull would have been from in the cellar. So, uh, so I just... I'm just saying that there needs to be more communication before you get there. Can you there. tell us the name of the customer or set? No, don't tell us the name. Send the name to Olivia. <laughs> Olivia knows. Neil. Olivia I know, knows. I, I know exactly. Okay. Yeah, John, I know exactly who you're talking about. And this was addressed. Yeah, there was a follow-up appointment. Um, yeah, I had it addressed immediately as soon as you told me. You're always great, Olivia. So. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. All right, I'm going to move on to Jeremy Hansen. Go ahead, Jeremy. So very good news about the 200 customers and such. Um, <clears throat> so I was just wondering, if we were to clear the backlog tomorrow, how many more does that add? I mean, of the people who want service and we're, we're ready to give it to them. OK, um, I don't have those numbers. Olivia, do you happen to have those numbers handy? I'm, I'm trying to think about who would have those numbers. It's about I can, 200. I can, yeah, I think it's about 200. I think David Healy is correct. Cool. Thank you. Tom Fisher. Um, just a, <clears throat> similar to John, I had uh, on Eclipse Day, so a truck come up the driveway looking to do an installation. Um, they've been doing drops for a while now and leaving coils next to poles, and that's fine. It's like you said, not indoor work. Um, but I was a little surprised to have somebody just unannounced come up the driveway and say, okay, we're here to do your installation for your conduit, <laughs> which I don't have. So <laughs> oh, God. Um, it was listed as potentially going to be a conduit site, but I've since had somebody come out and we've talked about it. We found an aerial route that'll work better. Um, and so just said, sorry, yeah. try the next place. But just wanted to note that, you know, another case of where, you know, there was no forewarning or call ahead or anything like that. Well, that's the first I've heard of an installation drop in. <laughs> Usually <laughs> they will not waste their time if it's not scheduled, uh, you know, you, 10 o'clock on, on Tuesday, so that's interesting. Okay, good good to know there. Yeah, the process, just to clarify, the processes, there's two processes. There's the drops process, and that is not scheduled, and it previously wasn't being announced, but it is going to be being announced now. And then there's the second, which is the installation, and that is always scheduled or should be always scheduled. So those are two very different processes, and they both have to occur. John Russell. Well, I had the same problem as Tom in which they just showed up thinking that I had a conduit that would have been 600 feet long. And I'd already talked to somebody and we'd already decided that it would come from a pole aerially, um, you know, weeks before. So they just they just showed up and were dragging the, um, the fiber from the wrong pole thinking that there was a uh, a conduit starting there, which wasn't. Luckily, I came home. It's like, you, you see, they're just doing all their work, but they don't know really what they're supposed to do. I think there needs to be something more than just their iPads. And 
actually, when they came to do the install, they just showed up. Knock, knock, knock on the door. Here we are. They couldn't tell whether I was home or not because my garage door was shut, but they did come to the door and I let them in. They did a great job. Everything's fine. But I, like I said, I just think there needs to be more communication between the homeowner and um, the people from Eustis. I guess it's just Eustis that's uh, doing the uh, st installs and the... And, Eustis and the is drops. only doing... Yeah, Eustis is, is, is only doing the drops themselves. Waitsfield does the actual installation of, of the electronics. Well, Those, from what we've always understood, were, were, were highly organized and scheduled. If that's not the case, then we uh, definitely want to know so we about need to that. have some conversations with them. Well, yeah, well I mean, this will be the first I've, I've, I've heard of it, so yeah. But it was Eustis that did the, the install here. They did the drop, and then they did the install. The electronics and everything? Yeah. The they did it right. But, you know, it said Eustace on the truck. Well, that's news to all of us, I think. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk to Wayne's cool. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you, John. Uh, Olivia, go ahead. Uh, I wanted to address a comment that David Healy left in the sidebar. So it's something that we're thinking of updating. So right now we have site survey door hangers, which is another prerequisite um, that is unannounced, but we're thinking of putting a special section for technician notes and a phone number if there are special requests for the customer to reach out, because that time period between a site survey and a drop is really, you know, it's like the open window. And I'm thinking that the door hanger should be updated at this point. Um, also indicating whether your drop um, is aerial or conduit, or you have the option of doing aerial instead of conduit, which is kind of like a 2B classification at this point. So again, we've been doing this a little bit now, and we're getting a little bit more mature in terms of you know the, the process. So just wanted to let you know that on the marketing front, we're, we're making updates accordingly. Any other comments, questions? Okay, we're gonna go to the marketing update and outlook. Um, I will start with, it's been a busy month weather-wise. <laughs> Two stores, snowstorms, uh, a solar eclipse, couple mud seasons. Um, I wanna first start by expressing gratitude to John Reed who represented CB Fiber beautifully at the Woodbury Pie Breakfast. It was the first of the two snowstorms uh, I couldn't attend, Janiel couldn't attend. They actually postponed it from a Saturday to a Sunday, which was actually really smart uh, because the attendance was greater. Uh, but even with the photo snow, John spoke to a handful of, of folks there, um, auctioned off uh, insulation, uh, a free insulation um, that we we will be uh you know, doing on, on behalf of CB Fiber, and he had all of our marketing collateral in advance. So that event, really from a brand awareness perspective, we couldn't have asked for anything anything better. Um, in terms of our digital marketing, uh, we have a new page on our website. Uh, now that we have paying customers, um, we wanna make sure that our marketing material is not so salesy, but we wanna educate and retain and inform customers as well. So I've been working hand in hand with Waitsfield and taking some of the material from their website to make sure it's consistent on ours and essentially applying our brand components. So there's two downloadable assets on that connectivity tips page. We have an optimization guide and a voicemail user guide. Again, this will be, this is meant as a hub for more material to come, but it's a really good starting point. So if, if any customers have questions, uh, we'll be developing a Q&A that is specific to them and not for the pre-registration folks, which is a whole different section. Um, in terms of conduit, um, Waitsfield doesn't have a specific date, but we're hoping to get conduit and or rotting installations started in a couple of weeks. Now that will help lead to an influx in terms of our numbers. Um, but it also means that they need to send out an email to notify everybody who needs conduit to get started on that. Um, the tricky part is, of course, 
there's people that want to do conduit on their own. They need references to contractor specifications. I know NEK is doing a separate program uh, uh, to help with, with that. Um, but I'm actually interested to see out of those folks for conduit who will actually move forward with conduit and who will shy away from being a CB Fiber customer because of that. Um, we just don't have enough information right now to know how many will be retained as customers and who will actually back out from CB Fiber because of that um, information. So this is just something that I want to start keeping track of as we move from the spring to summer season. Um, and the other thing that I'm working on right now, actually this is new as of this morning, um, I've been working with Siobhan and Janiel. We're going to be doing a quarterly town update moving forward. So now that we're in April, Q1 is done. Um, similar to our annual report, we'll be sending out a PDF to all of our town clerks, uh, but just with some key stats and milestones and progress um, information, posting it on our website as a press release and sharing it on all of our social media and front porch forum as well. Again, we don't want to be too salesy for all the folks who don't have CB Fiber in their outlook for the next year, but we want to make sure that we're keeping people informed of our progress. RD, why don't you go ahead? You're muted. Can't hear you, RD, I'm sorry. Can you can you put your comment in the chat? I can mute participants, but I can't unmute them. That's weird. We're just waiting for RD to comment here. Nope, go ahead. Okay. All right, I'm going to circle back to the uh, minutes, meeting minutes approval, because we have a quorum now. We haven't lost anybody, right, Tom? Um, uh, so, Sybil, do you have a motion for me? You're muted. I could have a motion for you. <laughs> I um, I would just move to um, approve the minutes for the March 12, 2024 governing board meeting as drafted. Unless, Alan Gilbert, you know you made some corrections. Do I have a second? I don't, I don't remember seeing the minutes. Uh oh. Has anybody oh. seen the minutes from March? Um, maybe okay. we don't have them. I thought I saw them. Well, I send them to you and Jeremy. Oh, I bet Jeremy what didn't get them out. Yeah, Jeremy. Yeah, I did it. I, I did a search of my Jeremy file and there was nothing in there from March. Okay. Governing All right. Board, so, so we don't have these. So never mind. We don't have these minutes yet. Yeah. All right. Not. So okay. we're going to move on to the next item. Thank you, RD. Um, and uh, why don't you go ahead and talk about the board resource hub, Olivia, please, and the HR update. Uh, I'll start with the board resource hub. So if you haven't received, um, I sent out a link last week. Um, it is a password protected page on our website that I would ask that we keep internally. Um, nothing, you know, nothing too confidential in there, but I do want to make sure that, you know, it is meant for delegates in order to stay informed um, of any resources that, so anything essentially that we're publishing to help keep our delegates informed, it will be saved on that page. Um, it just helps instead of searching through your emails for attachments, every, everything will be uploaded into there. Um, in addition, it will help with onboarding and training. Um, and also our recent um, HR uh, meeting we had a couple weeks back, we have links to all of the resources along with the video. So if you haven't had a chance to, to look at that, um, it, it's, it's all saved on that page. So again, just to have one single source of truth, that was my goal with launching the page. And also as we perhaps transition with new people coming into new delegate seats, new committees, um, this will help in that onboarding process. So that was the goal of launching that page. Also wanna add here, if you haven't 
done the training yet. You need to do the training. We are legally required for you to do the training. And I need you to sign the piece of paper that says I did the training so that we've got that on file. This is all just, this is all grant procedure, dotting I's and crossing T's and also helping our culture and our, our organization be cool. <laughs> so, cause we we're where it's at, man. Anyway, so that I just wanted to add that on top of that. Um, did you have something else, Olivia or Janelle, that you wanted to add to the HR thing? No. Yep. Okay. Privacy policy. Alan, do you want to make a motion? And maybe give us a background there. I know you're working on it. Got there it. Got go. it. Got it. Got it. Okay, here. Uh, sure. So the privacy policy is up for approval. And in a minute, I'll make a motion for that. Uh, basically, here's what's happened as quickly as I can. We had a privacy policy overview developed last year and that has been in force, uh, still is enforced uh, as I speak. And we knew that we would have to be developing a full policy rather than just an overview, but we knew we had to coordinate uh, things in our policy with things that were in uh, what uh, WCVT's policy. So Janiel uh, sat down with the uh, with the WCVT people and started working. And also, I think you consulted with some people at NEK Broadband and had some other ideas that and, you wanted and Maple. to add. And Maple. And, and yeah. Maple as well. So what what you have in front of you or what was sent to you is a new revised uh, full CV fiber privacy policy. There is a separate Wagefield Champlain Valley Telecom policy as well. And if you read our policy, you'll notice that we reference that people, our, our customers have to look not only at our policy, but also at the WCVT policy because that applies to them as well. It would have been really hard, we felt, to put the two together. So it seemed to make more sense to have two separate ones, but with reference that they're tied together. So basically what we did was we just went through and added all the all the language that you really need to have a full privacy policy. We only had sort of a very broad overview before. And what you have in front of you, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. But otherwise, I'll make a motion that the governing board adopt the new CV fiber uh, privacy policy. Do I have a second? Second. David. Okay, motion made by Alan Gilbert, seconded by David Healy. Do we have any discussion of the privacy policy motion approval that we have before us? Anybody have any questions or? things they'd like to address. I am not seeing any. Do I have any objections to the motion? Again, not seeing any. Do I have any abstentions? And the motion passes. Yay, Thank you, everybody. Privacy policy. Finally, yes, right. Yeah. Thanks, Janelle. Um, it's a lot of work, I know. Yeah, yeah, Thank absolutely. You. So the next thing up is the drops and line extension fee schedule, not policy. Janelle, why don't you go ahead with that? Sure. So we originally had a, a schedule, I'm using the term, um, to, to charge the customer $1 per foot after the drop pole to the point of connection at the, at the um, house or business. And that was confusing in its understanding for our customers. People didn't know what that meant. Where's the takeoff pole? How many feet is it? Is it more than 400 feet? They couldn't tell. The definition of the takeoff pole was confusing. And further, we found that when Waitsfield was going out, they were applying um, a different kind of policy or schedule. And that is that they weren't charging the customer. They weren't charging the customer. We weren't charging the customer. So the process on the ground because of practical reasons was to simply have one flat rate essentially for for the for the um 
regardless of the length for the drop. And so we decided to make our policy or our schedule match what was actually practical and feasible on the ground. And so we took out that dollar per foot after 400 feet from the takeoff pole and made it a flat rate um, drop fee. So that is what our new line extension policy is. It's more, it's more predictable to the customer. It's more equitable to the customer. It means that the customer doesn't have to go out and measure and potentially not take service because of confusion or try to figure out what a takeoff pole is. Um, and, and very importantly, it is consistent with what Waitsfields was already doing and what makes practical sense on the ground. So that is our that is our policy, what we're calling a line extension drops fee schedule. And we need a motion on this, I think. We do. Yeah, OK. All right. Uh, John Morris, your hand is up. Go ahead. I noticed in the fee schedule that it says that it doesn't include any conduit. Um, my my understanding before was that we were considering including conduit, but we're not right now. Not yet. Um, we are doing an analysis of that. We're, we we don't have the numbers to 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 we don't have the numbers yet to make an informed decision on that, like what it will cost us. <clears throat> we are doing the analysis. In fact, David Mannix, David Healy, and um, Tom Fisher have done some significant looking into it and have consulted with Waitsfield. And we're we are going to look at possibly covering conduit in the future, but we're not quite there yet with the numbers that we have available to us. So at this point, we're just uh, covering both aerial and underground, but not covering the cost of actually burying the service. That is correct. Thank you. Um, Tom Fisher. I move that we accept this fee schedule as drafted. Second. Who was that that seconded? That was Christopher. Christopher, thank you, Christopher. It was moved by Tom Fisher, seconded by Christopher Shank to uh, adopt the fee schedule as drafted. Do we have any discussion or comments or questions? Any interpretive dance numbers about the fee schedule? Okay, no. All right. This is pretty so incredible, I... Siobhan. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> Yes, yes, it is awesome. All right, so um, do I have any objections? Do I see any objections to this fee schedule as proposed and moved? Not seeing any objections. Do I have any abstentions? Not seeing any abstentions. Yay, it passes. The fee schedule passes. This is important work. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, the next item is NEK CV Fiber um, and Executive Committee Authority. Janelle, why don't you just go ahead with that? Yeah. Okay. So we we were we were talking about how we make decisions at CV Fiber. These are these are related. Um, so we we believe that um, the Executive Committee um, being being uh, the heads of the various committees. And uh, integrally really uh, involved in the day to day with CV Fiber might be better positioned to make some of the major decisions at CV Fiber rather than requiring a vote of the board. For instance, the two motions we just passed um, for the line extension uh, fee schedule and the privacy policy perhaps could be in the hands of the executive committee um, rather than the full governing board. So we considered that. We, we are now talking with NEK Broadband about working together, whether, you know, what what a merger might look like if a merger is possible and what authority and governance would apply if we were to to um, become one CUD. So I, I believe that in, in having this conversation about um, decision making, executive authority, um, executive committee authority versus board 
authority for various decisions. We need to get through the 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 governance um, with with NEK to see what the future looks like with our CUD and with um, potentially a joint CUD before we make any decisions internally about changing how we make decisions within CV Fiber. So we are going to not change our current structure of decision making immediately, but we are currently talking with NEK Broadband about um, potentially merging and what that would look like. And that is a whole series of questions that we're that we're um, looking at from a very from various points of view, including finance, construction, operations, communications, um, governance. So we we will get through that conversation and and we have subgroups set up between CV Fiber and NEK Broadband to discuss these things. We've hired a consultant to help work through the process and merger legislation is sitting in front of the, um, the House uh, now it, it, the, in the Vermont legislature. It has already passed the Senate. This would make a merger much more feasible, which would allow CUDs to join and um, position themselves for many opportunities and efficiencies, not only funding opportunities as we go into BEAD to strengthen us in this competitive process, but also to share resources in a way that would allow us to control the construction and operations um, in, a more, in a more efficient way. Uh, Jeremy, or Jerry, Jerry, go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, I have. I, I think, and let me know, please correct me where, wherever I misstate here. I think the main driver for this has been the bead grant and the ability to compete for bead. And my question is, why is it not that the VCBB is the applicant? for the bead grant for all CUDs. Why is that burden on the individual? They have more employees than we do. I don't understand why the burden is on the CUDs to, to, to make the application. I can answer that. It is structural. It's how it's how um, BEAT is structured. So they are a grantee, and we would be subgrantees. So the state of Vermont was awarded 229 million under the, under BEAT, and now it, it becomes a competitive process, and the uh, the CUDs then are, or not just the CUDs, but also other providers can come in and put a an, an application in to be a subgrantee to that greater grant that was given to Vermont as a whole. Um, David Haley has his hand up and he's done a lot of work oh, with can this. I follow yeah. up before yeah. you go to David? Yeah. And I, I apologize for backseat driving, but that didn't really didn't answer my question. I, I realize that the state has gotten so much money, but I still don't understand why the VCBB isn't the one that is doing this for the public entities that are CUDs in Vermont, there are oversight. I, I, I don't understand why they're not doing that for everyone and making the individual CUDs basically compete with each other for these funds. It, 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 it seems that it doesn't, it doesn't jive with the purpose of the publicly backed CUD model. And, and I'll stop there, but it's a question. Yeah. I can you take wanna, a you, you want to? Okay. So BEAD is entirely different than the VCB's, VCBB's Act 71 responsibilities. So it's a federal program. And what VCB did in, in applying for the money had to develop the procedures by which it would fairly allocate or distribute the money based on who could service the, un, the eligible locations most effectively and most cost effectively and effectively. So it became sort of, you know, even though what you're saying is absolutely correct, that there are, that's who we, we answer to, but because of the way the law is written and the rules are written, they're between a rock and a hard place about playing favorites to the CUDs. Um, so it, it really does become a competitive advantage kind of situation in applying for the money. But what I, I was also gonna add, um, 
in talking to Krista recently, they NEK Broadband applied for a USDA Rural uh, Reconnect loan. In their loan, they included 500 addresses in CB Fiber. The loan amount they're getting with asked for is for 14 million, I think. So there's some good, you know, they got the grant. They they are what she told me. They are one of the first to apply for the money, and it's the first in, first out in terms of when they run out of money, <laughs> there's no more money. But they got their application in day two, I think. And so unless there's some problems with their grant application, which it could be, um, there's some good news for CV Fiber in that. Jerry, does that answer your question? I mean, VCBB can't favor CUDs over another, say, CCI. Yeah, I think I, th I think I've got it. Thank you. Because of the lobbyists. That's the short answer. Anybody else have any comments on that? Oh my God, are are we done? That was the last item on my agenda that I'm looking at. Oh, John Reed. All right. Thank goodness you saved us, John. Go ahead. So is there a, a motion or a proposal here in terms of of uh, streamlining? Uh, especially no, not yet. Not yet. It, this. Yeah, this was more informative. Oh, that was the other thing I wanted to mention is we are having a special executive committee meeting on Thursday with um, NEK to discuss stuff. So that's that's a special meeting that got called. It's it's been warned. It's been warned. Has it been warned? Yes. It'll be warned shortly. Yeah, it got warned. Yeah. So that's that's happening. So if you're it, it, it's uh, this is all happening very quickly. We have to get all of this these decisions worked out. We have to answer all of these questions to figure out if this is even feasible in order to apply for the CU the the bead money. Um, so this is all happening a little fast, and we're probably going to have more special meetings coming up as 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 things shake out. So okay. if you have well, more questions, I have a, go ahead, John. I have a couple of comments. Um, one is, you know, as CD Fiber moves more to an operational organization, um, in general, I support um, moving decision making more to executive committee and to staff. Um, and if there's something, especially with discussions on NEK, be happy to hear about that. Um, speaking generally, I think that that's an idea that would be better driven by the board and not the executive committee or by staff. Um, and lastly, uh, the privacy policy and changing pricing, you know, are two things that I would think you'd want to have full board um, vote on, if nothing else, to have thumbprints on it. Um, there's nothing urgent about either of those two things. And so those, to me, do not seem like good examples of something that you'd want to leave in the hands of, uh, of an executive committee. Um, just for PR purposes, if nothing else. But those are my observations. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, I don't know if I should address anything right now. I think it's premature to try and address. We will definitely take that. We're definitely taking that into consideration. Absolutely. You're not wrong. Um, there's it, there's a lot. It's, there's so many questions. I'm tired. Janelle, are you tired? You look tired. I'm tired. Oh, I, I'm a little tired. It's, it's okay. It's okay. We can make. We, we'll, we'll get through. We'll get through this. Simon. Simon is tired too. Simon says we're at the end of the agenda, and that it's time to go. Does anybody have anything else they want to talk about, or anything they want to say? Alan. Alan, your hands up. I, go ahead, I, Alan. I did have a. I did have a question about something I ran into, um, about the. CCI reconfiguration that's happening. Apparently, the PUC um, had received a a um, what would you call it? Has intervener status by itself and sent to the PUC comments 
about why they were, I believe, opposed to what the CCI, what 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 the what CCI and its and its possible uh, uh, partner or pay, takeover company uh, might be doing. And what the PUC told NEK was that they are not going to accept multiple um, opinions from the different CUDs. The CUD should get together and make up one single opinion yeah. about how they feel about the the, the case. Yeah. And I I was I, I was sort of surprised about that because it seems to me somebody should have figured out somewhere in CUD land that w there should be one voice speaking and not all the different CUDs, but I guess NEK went ahead and 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 I, I believe had an attorney to put in a very a pretty pretty well developed series of questions for the CCI thing. So I'm I'm just trying to figure out how how this is all playing out because okay. it seems at times there is cooperation, there isn't cooperation, and one government entity says you guys have to do all this stuff together. Another government entity says you have to do it separately. It it, it gets pretty confusing after a while. Okay, so I can answer that. Um, CCI is looking at possibly being bought out, and and we CV Fiber together with EC Fiber and a couple other CUDs filed an intervention motion um, using our council. Um, Vicuda also filed an intervention motion, and NEK Broadband and a couple other CUDs filed a third um, intervention motion, and NEKs included a discovery request. So the PUC came back with an order last week and said, hey, CUDs, you guys should all work together, talk to each other. So our we, we met on this this morning, Vicuda met on this, and we're having the three attorneys talk to each other and talk to us and decide if there are sufficiently identical issues that we should all act as one CUD or if it would be beneficial for us to continue with as separate entities because just because we're a CUD all CUDs does not mean that we have identical interests with CCI and or whoever buys CCI. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to make that assumption right now. We want to cooperate with the PUC's order which was work together, but at the same time we we must preserve that we might be differently situated. So there might actually be some people who very much want to work with a CCI or a new CCI or whatever. In fact, I guess some are already, at least in yep. the southern part of the state. Yeah, two yeah and more. David just... Yeah, David just put it in the chat. That's right. And so so you can't assume that their interests are identical to our interests or if there's RDOF, CCI in some CUDs and not in others, there's just potentially different interests that we need to be aware of. So we are we are getting the three lawyers together to determine what is the best way to proceed. And those those attorneys were were representing three different groups of CUDs. Is there a timeline for how long the PUC review is going to take? I mean, this sounds like it could get very complicated very quickly. Um, yeah, well, we're we're meeting this week with the, the lawyers on Friday, so we're going to move quickly. And they're okay. they're they're very well maybe I think there is like maybe a, a couple week um, response time every every order is appealable we can object object to it um, and we're moving quickly to identify whether we want to object to it we haven't taken any formal stance on it as of yet great thank you thank you for staying on that Alan I appreciate that because that had fallen off my radar. My radar has a very low range on it. <laughs> Tom Fisher, go ahead. Speaking of <clears throat> public service department um, RFPs, I saw one recently came up for the BCBB Broadband Equity Access uh, BEAD program um, support. I'm wondering, has anybody looked at that? Is there anything that CD Fiber should be taking consideration there of, I don't know if, if we have to want to weigh into whoever's providing support or, or anything like that? It's um, it, now is this this is VCBB asking for um, asking for equity support. I, I'm, the R, I, I'm sorry, could you summarize what the RFP um, was? So the, the title underneath it says the Vermont Community Broadband Board seeks proposals for contracts to support implementation of the oh. bead program. 
Okay. Yep. So, so uh, yes. Um, so I sat on the digital equity core team and we had Vernon, uh, VCBB had Vernon Berg group do a digital equity plan, which was adopted. And so now it must be implemented. Um, part of what Vicuda is doing is um, requesting that we put together a study group so that a deeper look can be had at what we need for long-term um, equity in Vermont, not just not just implementing um, the bead program, which of course must happen, the digital equity plan must be implemented, and that's what the RFP is for, but also how how best to implement equity plans going forward, especially since the ACP went away. So we have a couple things going there. It's, yes, the VCBB absolutely plays a role. Vicuda plays a role in that we are attempting to influence um, how the, the the plan is a plan is implemented, not just through B, but through equity generally through the state of Vermont. Did I answer? Did was there a question in there? Did I answer it? There was, and you answered it. Thank you. Okay. Any anything else? All right, I am going to go ahead and adjourn us at 6.59 p.m.